All right, we are in Isaiah chapter 38. We saw some amazing things as God moved on behalf of not just Hezekiah, but the nation of Israel when he slew 185,000 of the invading Assyrian troops. Uh, I'm a fan of ancient history, love that stuff. And all of this stuff is historically corroborated in extra scriptural tradition in history. In fact, in today's day and age, all you got to do is Google it. And, and you can see that in the year 701, uh, that indeed uh, the Assyrian armies came into Judah and surrounded Jerusalem. And there was a miraculous intervention there. In fact, the Greek historian Herodotus writes of this very event. And he says what took their lives was the bubonic plague. How did he know? Was he there? I don't know how he knew, but that's what he said hundreds of years before Christ. So he was closer to the original event. So what we've got in chapter 38 is kind of, this is what happens after a great act of deliverance and a mighty move of God. You've got to come off that mountaintop. And there's valleys below. And sometimes we don't agree with what God is doing. Now, when he's doing stuff that we agree with, hey, I won the lottery, hey, hey, well, wonderful, great. When God says, I have this sickness for you, most of us go, yeah, you know? And yet, he allows these things in our lives, does he not? He is God. He could just say, nobody's getting sick from this point forward. But that's not exactly how he works. You know, my Bible says in Romans 8, 28, maybe you cut this out of your Bible, I don't know. Mine says, all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes. That means the good and the bad and the ugly. The stuff that you like, that you go, yay, that's wonderful. And then the things that God allows in your life that you don't like and aren't pleasant. I've been fielding phone calls all, all week about people that my, my poor wife is homesick and Wendy's sick. Out and back Wendy's house, uh, at Ed, the list goes on and on of the people that are sick. But that's the same in all churches. It's not that God's singling you out and saying, you deserve COVID, you know. Well, maybe we do, but uh, I don't think that's what he's doing. I think that this is life in a sinful, fallen world. And we look forward to the time when those things won't be here anymore. A day is yet future of us. God had done an amazing thing, and I'm sure that for a while, he and Isaiah, King Hezekiah and Isaiah, were just walking on the tops of clouds. Ooh, look at this mighty act of deliverance. And the Assyrians went home with their tail between their legs. And, and eventually, uh, uh, his sons, the, the, uh, the ruler, uh, was killed by his own sons in his own temple 20 years after God's deliverance uh, of Israel in 701. Uh, an amazing thing. Sennacherib and people like him always have their day of accounting coming. The tyrants of the world, the mighty, the powerful, the rich, the elite, those of those that snub their nose at God, you know, their, their reign is temporary, their enjoyment of wealth very temporary. And, and sometimes they are snatched off the face of this earth. What we think is too early. Why do the young die? Did you know that there's only one scripture in the whole Bible that tells us why the young die? God does that to spare them from evil. It says, that's an amazing thing. In other words, knowing what lies ahead, as God does, sometimes he takes them home because there's lots of things worse than death. Sometimes living is twice the hell that dying is and finding yourself in that place. It, you ask people in a war zone, ask the people of Ukraine, you know, uh, living sometimes is, is a terrible thing. But coming off of this mountaintop experience that we read about in Isaiah 37, we find ourselves at the start of chapter 38. Maybe you can identify with this if you've had some of the sicknesses and scourges that have gone through uh, our church and society today. In those days, after the deliverance, we don't know exactly how long, but I'm going to pinpoint a time frame here for you. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, went to him and said, this is what Yahweh says. Notice the Lord is all in capitals there. That translates the Hebrew Y-H-W-H, God's name, is Yahweh. So this is what Yahweh says. Put your house in order because you are going to die. You will not recover. 
I like Hezekiah because he's as blunt as I am. I like that, which is why I'm not a good counselor, because I kind of like to just find out what the issue is, get right to it, share with you what the Bible says, pray with you, and kick you out of my office. So if it takes longer than five minutes, one of us is too long-winded. Because God's got it. I mean, look at how brief this, this whole account is. But notice it says that Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. Now, putting together all of, all of the numbers, comparing with 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 2, 2 Kings chapter 20 and verse 6, Hezekiah is only 39 years old. 39 years old. But notice that God sends his prophet Isaiah to tell him, this is the will of the Lord. Now, there's a claim, name and claim of theology that says, no, 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 no. It's not God's will that any of us ever get sick. Really? All of us are supposed to be healthy. All of us are supposed to be wealthy. All of us are supposed to be prospering. So what do you tell a guy like this? Well, it must be your faith that's the problem. And that's why God's you know, whooping a hurting on you because you don't have any faith. Well, the fact of the matter is we've seen his life. He's a good and godly man. He has great faith. He has done wonderful things. God has spoken to him often. He's got Isaiah right there so that if he steps out of line a millimeter, Isaiah is there to say, King, whoa, back here. There's accountability in that. I like that. I like that. Most of us like it unless we don't want to hear it. You want me to tell you, you know, it's God's will that tomorrow you win the lottery. You're going to be a happy camper. Please tithe. We would like to hear that. It would put, it did. It put a smile on her face. But if I also told you by the word of God, sorry, Dwayne, you're going to die. This, this carbuncle that you got, you know, this pain, this trial, this whatever, you know, get your house in order because it's God's will that you die. We don't like to hear that. We like the pleasant stuff. We like it when life comes to us with, you know, vase full of 12-stem roses, you know, that along a box of chocolates. That's when life is good. But when you got COVID, you're thinking life is not so good. And then there's that still small voice in your ear that's the voice of Satan that says, well, you just had more faith, you wouldn't be sick. If you were really godly, if you were really tight in your walk with the Lord, you wouldn't have gotten COVID. There must be some sin in your life. Do you see how you can torture yourself with that one? Because we know we all fall short. So when Satan, the voice of condemnation, when we hear that, we have to say that he's a liar and he's the father of all lies, and he says things to us like that. But this is an amazing statement. It is God's will that you die at 39 years of age. Most of us, if we were related to this 39-year-old, would have a problem with that. Knowing it's the perfect will of God does not always make it easier to embrace. I look back over all sorts of things that have happened down through my life that were of no doing of my own. They just, bad things happen to good people sometimes. You know, and there is no explanation. Well, you know, it's because I sinned or because I deserve it or this or that. And there's always that voice of condemnation. But in your heart of hearts, you know that you're saved by grace and kept by grace. God is love and he loves you. He's paid the price for all of that. Yes, we claim those verses. By his stripes, we are healed. But then James says, if any among you be sick, you need to gather the elders together and anoint him with oil and then see what God does. Okay, there's a time and a place for that. Luke on his, excuse me, Paul on his second and third missionary journeys apparently developed some sort of nasty eye disease that he picked up in the swamps of southern Galatia on his second missionary trip. And it says in 2 Corinthians, three times he asked God, heal me, please. And if we can paraphrase it, God said, no. My grace is sufficient. It is not always God's will that we be healed. Sometimes he has higher purposes in mind that we're not aware of. What we have to do is not fight God on it. Don't whine, murmur, grumble, and complain. I've tried all of those. They don't work well with God. I've tried every, I'm just trying to spare you the rod here, you know. I I don't want you in line for those kind of lessons that I had to learn the hard way. It is not God's will 
that you always be healed. It is God's will that he wants to take Isaiah home. Here's why. He knows what's going to happen if he lets him live. And that's chapter 39. And it's a train wreck. It is a certifiable train wreck on more levels than I can describe to you in this chapter. But that was a gracious act of God to take him home. I've seen people that are suffering so horribly. I have prayed that God would miraculously heal them. I've anointed them with oil and then praised God when they passed away. Let's, let's embrace the will of God, whatever that might be. I believe in miracles. I've seen miracles. I have experienced miracles. And I'm sure your testimony is identical to mine. But the fact of the matter is, he doesn't heal everybody I've anointed with oil. I wish he did. Do you know one time in my ministry years ago, they actually called me Dr. Doom? Because when I would go on my hospital visitations, I would anoint somebody with oil and they would promptly die. I, talked, I felt so guilty about it. One time I talked to a, a, a doctor who was the head of the ICU at Memorial, and I said, you know, what's the deal? I come in here and I pray for these people all the time, and I, I know I have faith in this. And he says, Jim, get a handle on this. 90% of the people that walk in ICU don't walk out. Everyone that does is a walking miracle. But understand, statistically, 90% of the people that come here don't walk out, buddy. And it's not your fault. Pretty wise words coming from a pagan doctor that I knew well. But I needed to hear that. God doesn't allow these things in your life because he doesn't love you, but because he does. He does. I got a call yesterday and my, my kid brother, my kid, he's 64 years old. But to me, that's a kid, you know. But anyway, I get a call and he's, he's in uh, ICU uh, at St. Francis Hospital up here. <clears throat> and he's got a kidney stone the size of a pea. Now, I don't know if you know much about bioanatomy in the human body. You can't pass something that big. That's like giving breech birth to a cannonball that's got claws out. You cannot do that. So he's going into surgery uh, Friday uh, at 1 o'clock. And I'd appreciate you remembering my brother Jan is his name, J-A-N, Dutch for John. I don't know. There's no Dutch in our family at all. Where mom came up with that, I don't know. She's not around to ask anymore, but we've always thought he was related somehow or another to the milkman because he was the only one born with blonde hair. Anyway, that, no, that's another story. <laughs> we teased him his whole life. You're not blood. You know, where'd you get the brown head and the, and the, and the eyes? And the, you know, no, we <laughs> razzed him about that. But uh, he could stand your prayers. You can stand your prayers. Nobody likes surgery. And Satan uses those things to test our faith. God allows it to test our faith, but he means to discourage us by that. So we get panic attacks. Before surgery, we get all hyped up. We, I mean, am I breathing fast? Or, you know, you, Satan, that's what Satan does. That's who he is. Now, how do you square that with the peace of God that passes all understanding? Mm. Satan is always out to rob us of every blessing that God ever wants to bestow upon us. So anticipate his move. Be way prayed up and way read up and, and way humbled before the Lord long before the surgery comes around, and you've got a better chance of bearing through it when it does. Because if I know anything, none of us are going to live past 150. You could be the first exception on planet Earth, but I doubt it. So all of life should be preparing us for that day unless the Lord Jesus comes, and I pray that he would. Trumpet sounds, and we all get changed in the twinkling of an eye. But I'll tell you what, the wise man is always prepared for death because you never know when it's going to happen. By Hezekiah's response here, I see that he wasn't spiritually where he needed to be because he's not, he's not in a spiritual position to take the news well. Just put yourself in his shoes. We don't condemn him tonight, but is there a lesson for us to be learned so that we might face calamity better than he did? Okay, just want you to plant that. I want you to plant that question in your mind. Can I possibly handle my 
bad news that may come down the pike someday better than Hezekiah did. So it is God. What is the opposite of the perfect will of God? The permissive will of God. In other words, God will do it for you, but it's not his perfect will. It's compromised. And so the outcome is not going to be what God wanted it to be. The man prays for an extension of his life, but it was the perfect will of God to take him home. Because he knew he was going to blow the next 15 years of his life on stupid stuff. And God said, I don't want to spare you that. I want to spare you that pain. I want to spare you all of the stuff you have no idea lies in your future. So the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, this is what the Lord says, put your house in order. I think that's gracious. That means make sure your life insurance is paid up your mortgage, your bills. Make sure you know who's getting what in your estate. Do you have a will? Okay, you might want to pencil it out and have somebody sign it, you know, because you're going to, not going to be around much longer to take care of this stuff. That's gracious, isn't it, where God warns you. I'm amazed at how many people I've ministered to over the years that say, hey, I know my time is coming. I know the Lord's taking me home, and I just want to take care of this. I want to take care of that. I want to make sure this is done. That's wise, and that's a gracious, not it doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, I have always seen that as the most gracious act of God. You wonder why some people pass away suddenly, a heart attack or a stroke, and other people linger. Maybe God's giving them time to get their house in order. Possibility? Okay. I know there's a part of you and me that says, I, man, I hate to see people suffer. I do with all of my heart. I hate to see that. But sometimes... I know that God gives them time to get their house in order. And that's a gracious act. So I, bottom line is when I don't understand what's going on, I turn to God and exercise my faith. God didn't ask us to figure him out. He asked us to trust him. Do you trust him with life? Do you trust him with death? Do you trust him with your finances? You don't know your future, but I can tell you he's already been there. He's got it all. You, he knows what's coming, and you have no idea. But believe this, he will always do for you what is in your best interests, whether you agree with him or not. You look at how he dealt with the nation of Israel or the wilderness wanderings. They didn't always like him. Man, we've been three days without water. Dude! Where's their faith? Where's their faith? Why aren't, there, why aren't they asking God to intervene instead of complaining to God? Maybe that three days was a test to see if they would indeed pray. I mean, God showed them water as soon as they needed water. It's not like he's, he led them out of Egypt to perish in the desert. But they didn't have enough faith. And so God was going to teach them some lessons. Three days without water. You should have been praying on day one. You should have been praying on day two. You should have really been praying on day three because you can't survive a lot longer than that without water, especially in a 120-degree desert. It's a test. Most of life is. God is interested in building faith in you. And the only way I know of to do it is trials. I wish there was another way. But I have found him to be so faithful in the trials that I've gone through over these many years. I can't possibly doubt him from this point in time in the future. My kid brother, I have prayed and prayed and prayed. I'm not going to stop praying until God miraculously heals him or they go in there and blow up that stone with their little laser thingy that they're going to do on him. I don't know or care. I'm going to praise God either way. But I'm not going to allow the trials of life to destroy my faith. God wants to, he, Satan wants my faith destroyed. He wants me to worry and get fretful and get weird and freak out and take Valium or whatever the world's answers are. God wants us to just trust him. Trust him. He loves us. He knows what's best. So verse 2, let's see how this godly man responded. We can't identify with this because we are always perfect in our responses to the tragedies of life or bad news when it comes or medical diagnoses that we don't like. Let's see how he responds. Just because you're godly doesn't mean you're prepared should. I wish it did. Sometimes things catch you off guard, right? I mean, sometimes things come at you you just didn't see coming, and it does kind of rock your world for just a minute. But I want to be prepared for whatever comes ahead. I'm prepared by being in the Word of God every day. 
I'm prepared by being in prayer every day. I got a connection between heaven and earth that is like he's whispering in my ear. I want to be that close, and sin can put distance in that relationship. God wants you close enough to hear that still, small voice that Elijah heard when he was running away from a mouthy woman by the name of Jezebel hiding in the mountain of God. Okay, when he, and I, God, if I was God, I think I'd have showed up in the cave and said, where's your faith? You just slew 450 prophets of Baal? I did think, I, I, what is wrong with you, boy? Where is your faith? God didn't. God is so gracious, so kind. Anyway, it all worked out in that case, and, and let's see what happens here. Verse 2, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall. <laughs> I don't want to hear that. I am going to take me home. I don't want you to do that. I got a castle. I got riches. I go, well, I'm popular. People like me. I got lots of likes on Facebook. (laughs) Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to Yahweh. Remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully in wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Now, this is not the way to gain brownie points with God. Don't you remember how many times I read my Bible? Do you know how many times I went to church? I tithe. It was sacrificial to give my wealth to the Lord. You know, don't you remember? You know, I'll tell you what, if you're going to pray, don't appeal to your good works. Appeal to Jesus. Okay? He is your righteousness. He's already done all the good work. You got what to brag on? Let me hear it. Nothing. Nothing. All we like sheep have gone astray. That, so you don't want to go where he just went. You want to appeal to the mercy of God, but don't say, I deserve this. You, do, you just don't want to go. Does that, does that make sense to you? You go to God and you graciously ask for, for your desires, but then like his son in the Garden of Gethsemane did not, my will but yours be done, Heavenly Father. Nothing wrong with God with you telling God what you desire or a desired outcome. There's nothing wrong with that as long as it's born of the Spirit and not of the flesh. But then you kind of want to leave it in God's hands. God, whatever you want to do. I would like to do this, maybe this job opportunity, or maybe this situation, or I can go on vacation. But Lord, what do you want? What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to say? You want to live in the moment with God? You don't want to wait till Wednesday night to come and hope you can catch up with God again. Or when you walk out of here tonight, hope that you got enough God now to get you by till Sunday. <laughs> can I tell you, that's not how that works with your physical diet. Why would it work with your spiritual diet? Why would you come and feed yourself one time physically on a Wednesday afternoon and then fast all the way till Sunday morning and hoping that you feel just peachy keno and don't lose weight? You know, that... That's it's tough for most people. We are, take such great care of our physical selves. Why don't we put that much time and energy in our spiritual selves? Does that make sense? A good friend of mine a long time ago said, Jim, I will not partake of any physical food until I have partaken of spiritual food. And I have kept that with me for the last 30 years since John Corson uh, had said that at a pastor's conference. And I thought... Man, that's priority there. You keep God and the reading of his word and prayer and worship. You keep that priority, the physical stuff, yeah, that'll take care of itself. Don't have to worry about that. But don't, this is, this is not what I want you to do. Don't do a Hezekiah. Just write that in the margin of your Bible there, verse 2. Don't do a Hezekiah. Don't say, God, I've been so righteous. I've been so cool. I've been so good. I've been so godly. No, I'm going to appeal to Jesus. You know, while the prayer is questionable to us this side of the cross, he understand that in the Old Testament, they had a relationship with God based on obedience to the law. You read Deuteronomy 28 and 29. God says, I'll bless you when you obey my word. Here's what's going to happen when you don't. You kind of bring this on yourself. And plagues and COVID-19 and things like that are right there for the nation, the people, the individual that doesn't do it God's way. But it's our choice, isn't it? It's our choice is to walk with God and do it his way or not. But I don't appeal on the basis, we don't 
appeal to God on the basis of keeping the law, this side of the cross of Jesus Christ. He is my righteousness because I had none. The law condemned us. That's what the New Testament tells us throughout the book of Romans and, and uh, Hebrews, same thing over and over again. It served to condemn us. Verse 4, uh, I'm, I, can hear, I can hear Isaiah going, Oy vey. <sighs> What a ninny booper. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, verse 4. <sighs> okay, go and tell Hezekiah, this is what Yahweh, the God of your father David, says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. He does note that Hezekiah was earnest in his prayer misplaced as though it was. I've seen, your pr- I've seen your tears, heard your prayer. Here's what I will allow. This is now the permissive will of God. We have chosen not to obey the perfect will of God, and now we're kind of on our own, hoping that it turn- this hot mess turns out okay. God says, okay, you've badgered me into this. You want an extension of life? Let me show you why I didn't want to give that to you. I'm going to add 15 years to your life. He's only, like I said, 39. And verse 6, God says, And I will deliver you and the city from the hand of the king of Assyria, Sennacherib. I will defend the city. God says, I've always had it under my control. Whether it's your health or the health of the nation, don't worry about it. Pray about everything, but don't get selfish in your prayers. There's certainly room to make your petitions before God, but you want to yield to his perfect will. I'm just trying to prepare you because stuff is coming that you don't want to hear. Stuff, unpleasant stuff, I don't know what it is. Is it a job? Is it health? Is it relationships? I have no idea, but I know something is coming that Satan will attempt to shake your faith over. And God means to prove and test the metal of your faith and make it stronger if you rely on God. That's why he allows these tests. And then God, great, as if God's word isn't enough. If I was God, I'd have said, hey, you don't need a sign. Don't even bother asking for a sign by way of confirmation. I just told you, Isaiah just told you, what else do you need? Why isn't the Word of God enough for you? Sometimes we can read the Word of God and go, yeah, but, yeah, but. Do you know how many times I've had counseling appoints in my office and the Christian sits on the other side of the desk and I tell them what the Word of God says and then they go, yeah, but? Really? Where's your faith? Yeah, but, like you're the exception to the God's written Word. He hears you, he answers you. And you give me the yeah, but? I'm just giving you a hot tip in case you wind up in my office sometime in counseling. The moment you say, yeah, but, you're wrong. It's going to be a short counseling session from that point forward because you are not the exception to God's word. He said it. I believe it. That settles it. End of conversation. That's what faith says. It stands on the promises of God, not my wisdom, not my understanding. Well, why? What's God doing? You know, stop trying to figure God out. He has an IQ ever so slightly above yours. Would you agree? In comparison, we don't have the brain of an amoeba compared to Einstein. I mean, there is a universe of difference between your and God says, my ways are not your ways. So why are we trying to figure out his ways? He's asked us to exercise faith, not understanding. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says. You trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean upon your own understanding. And yet when trials hit, that's the first stick we grab. Like a dog on a bone. Well, I don't understand what God's doing. You don't need to. You have to trust him. That's how your faith is built. That's how your faith grows. So stop trying to understand. Go with the flow. Go with the flow. God, if you've allowed this for a sovereign reason or purpose I don't understand, 
I love you, and I know you love me, and you got it under control. I'm resting in that, resting in God. There's the peace of God that comes from peace with God that comes from our relationship with Jesus Christ, and all of us have that because, yep, we're all saved. Best I know. I mean, if the truth be told, the only person in this room I'm absolutely sure is saved is me. I wasn't there when you got saved, but I'm thinking that if you can tell a tree by its fruit, you're in good shape, okay? But putting the Word of God into practice in the midst of our trials is what builds our faith. Not trying to minimize your trials, please. Don't misunderstand me. I'm trying to throw you an anchor because the trials are coming. They are coming. And there's nobody on this planet, saved or unsaved, that's exempt from them. So I'm just trying to give you a heads up. Now is the time to build your faith. Now is the time to just get in the Word of God and hang on to every promise. Now is the time to immerse yourself in prayer. Because you don't want to go through a trial and find out there's a significant distance between you and God because of neglect. Did I word that too harshly? I didn't. I'm not trying to be harsh. I, I swear I'm not. But to me, the issue is faith. And there isn't any other issue on the table. Hezekiah flunked his test bigger than Dallas. I don't want to do the same thing. I'm trying to learn the same lessons that, that you are. So God says, okay, go back. I've heard your prayer, seen your tears. I'll add 15 years to your life. Verse 7, this is the Lord's sign to you. You don't need a sign. You should have enough faith to just claim my word. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you confirmation. And if we're going to be real with each other, sometimes I do need some confirmation. Lord, am I doing the right thing? Lord, am I making the right decision here? I mean, there's nothing wrong with an occasional second guessing yourself. You just want to be sure. And sometimes I just need that confirmation. And sometimes it'll come from sources I didn't understand. Dwayne will come up to me, pat me on the back, and, and without even knowing my situation, he speaks to me the very words of confirmation that remind me, yeah, God's got it. God's got this. You want to be that ambassador. You can be. You will be if you're walking close to the Lord. You're going to provide the confirmation for somebody else, and you're not even going to know it when it happens. Because that way God gets all the glory instead of you. Sometimes I know things have come out of your mouth that you said, man. You're speaking to yourself. You said, man, that was sharp. That was smart. That was great. That was the most intelligent thing I've said in 20 years. That was amazing. And then, then you hear in that still small voice, that wasn't you. That wasn't you. You're taking credit for something. <laughs> that, that wasn't you. I gave you that, Bronco. You're supposed to be helping other people. Get outside yourself, and you ain't all that smart, <laughs> you know? But sometimes, I, f I figure if he can speak through Balaam's donkey in the book of Numbers, I'm just the donkey du jour. That's it, the donkey of the day that he uses to speak through occasionally. Well, you want to be that donkey sometimes. And just speak the word of the Lord to people that need to hear that. Maybe it's going to be encouragement or confirmation or a reminder of how much he loves you. Or, or you're in a position of worry and God gives you a message through myself or online sources or other friends telling you not to worry. Don't freak out. Don't worry. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests known unto God. You know that Philippian stuff? Yeah, right out of the book. Of, yeah! That's where our faith grows. I wanted to be an ambassador of grace because I've received so much grace. I want to be an ambassador of love because I've been given so much love. I'm nobody's critic. You're, I don't stand in your shoes at Judgment Day. That's between you and the Lord. You're good people. I love you. God has wonderful things ahead for you. But we've got to go through. Jesus said in this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. That's the hope of the church. Jesus said he's overcome. So I want to get as close to him as I can so I can sneak in that same gate. Okay? He said, I've overcome. <laughs> Come here, Jesus. I want to get an arm lock on you because I want to walk through those gates of splendor because you've, you've already been there. He knows the way. So this is the Lord's sign, and here's where it gets a little weird. And I don't fully understand this passage, and I haven't met any commentator that did. Verse 7, this is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he has promised. I will make the shadow cast by the sun go back the ten steps it has gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. That's Hezekiah's father. So the sunlight went back ten steps. It had gone down. The parallel passage to this is 
excuse me, found in the, the books of the kings. Um, and it is interesting. There aren't a lot of Hebrew words. In fact, in, in the old uh, ancient Hebrew language, they only had about 8,679 words. So sometimes we have to, over 200,000 in English. So they, had, didn't just, they just didn't have the vocabulary that we do. Sometimes several words serve the same purpose. And you have to, context kind of denotes, well, what, what does it mean here? You know, the, the King James Version, if you have that version of the Bible with you, uh, says something like, Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees which it has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz, 10 degrees backwards, so the sun returned 10 degrees by which degrees it had gone down. That's a pretty cumbersome way of saying, the literal Hebrew says this, Behold, I will bring the shadow of the sundial, which has gone down on the sundial of Ahaz, back 10 degrees, or steps. The Hebrew word for degrees is the same word for steps. Is this a spiral staircase that the sun comes in the top of a window? I don't know. That is possible. But know this, that sundials predate the time of Isaiah by 800 years. This could very well be a sundial. The Egyptians had sundials. The Assyrians had sundials. The Babylonians had sundials. The Medes and the Persians had sundials. All of these guys had it. The ancient Greeks had sundials. So could this be a sundial? Absolutely. Now there was one interesting hypothesis from a Hebrew archaeologist over there who claims to have discovered several buildings that were so aligned east and west that when the sand came up and rose that the literal steps on the side of the temple told you what the time was. It could be both a sundial and a staircase. And the modern translations are pretty much evenly divided. Some interpret it staircase and some sundial. But the, the Hebrew word can mean either one. So this isn't where you want to draw a line in the sand and say, I'll forfeit my salvation over winning this one. No, 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 no. That's not where you want to go with this. But the point is, God says, I'm going to show you a miraculous sign. Now, God could have done that any way that he wanted to. He created the sun, moon, and stars, every planet that's out there. It, he could refract the light, not reflect the light, but refract the light like you do with light through a prism. Remember that from your elementary school days? You shine a light and a rainbow shows up on the wall. But God could have done that. That's refracted light, not reflected. A mirror is a reflection. Could God have done that and just reflected it back? You know, some people say, well, maybe God just spun the planet backwards. This planet moves this way at 1,000 miles an hour. Just imagine what happens if all of a sudden God said, Nope. Everybody would just keep spinning it a thousand miles an hour, you know? So I kind of don't think that's what God did. But he created the laws of physics in the universe. He, can, he, he made them. He can break them anytime he wants to. So how, but understand, here's where faith comes in again. I don't need an explanation from God as to how he did it. Just that he did it. This is the word of God. Do you believe it? With all of my heart. Something like this happened in the time of Joshua. Remember Joshua chapter 10, the long day of Joshua, where they're pursuing their enemies, and, but the sun's going down, and you know it's not like they had LED headlights on their cars back then. They didn't. So he prayed to the Lord, and God extended the day for another 24 hours. How God did that? I don't know. I have no idea. But it is remarkable to me, did a little homework on this, um, because you only got 8,679 words in Hebrew and uh, over 60,000 in Koine Greek. Greek is a much more later language, much more articulate. Uh, but the words that are, that are used here, I, I did a study on this, and it said, now if the sun stood still in the evening time and the moon there in the valley of Ajalon, then it would mean that over here on this side of the earth that they would have had a long night. I googled are there any civilizations that have historical records about a supernaturally long day or a supernaturally long night? Because if we can't find any evidence in any other culture that this took place, 
if we weren't men and women of faith, we would say, well, this passage is suspect, or maybe something got mistranslated or something like that. Here's what I found. out. Interestingly, in the ancient Chinese writings, there is a legend of a long day that was extended by 24 hours. The Incas of Peru and the Aztecs of Mexico have a very similar legend of a long day. And there is a Babylonian and Persian account of a day that was miraculously extended. Interesting stuff. I think we've got all the corroboration we need to say that God did it. Not, we're not told how God did it, but he did it. And he gave us Chinese and, and, and Babylonian and all of these other guys to give us the confirmation that indeed uh, these things took place. So, uh, that's the sign that he was going to give him. Verse 9, a writing of Hezekiah, a king of Judah. And this, is, he just waxes eloquent in praise and worship here. And I said, in the prime of my life, must I go through the gates of death and be robbed of the rest of my years? Well, yeah, it was the perfect will of God. You botched it, but yeah, you are. That's the, that's the short answer that you didn't want to hear. I will not again see the Lord. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What does he know from experience about the afterlife? Nothing. Nothing. So he's, oh, I never get to worship God again. Never get to, you're going to see God face to face. That's the part you don't understand. Don't be afraid of death. It's to be it beams you right in the presence of God. The Lord in the land of the living, oh, no longer will I look upon mankind or those that dwell in his world. Like a shepherd's tent, my house has been pulled down and taken from me. Please. Like a weaver, I've, I have rolled up my life, and he has cut me off from the loom day and night. You made an end to me. Man, you just don't want to use that kind of language with God. I waited patiently. There's where that song came from tonight. I waited. I waited patiently till dawn, but like a lion, he broke all my bones. That's figurative language. Night and day, you made an end of me. I cried like a swift or a thrush, a little bird caught in a net. I moaned like a morning dove. My eyes grew weak as I looked towards heaven. I am troubled, O Lord. Come to my aid. But what can I say? He has spoken to me, and he himself has done this. I will walk humbly all my years. It's easy to say that he would in verse 15. He didn't. That's why God wanted to take him home, because he knew a 15-year extension of his life was going to be a mistake on every conceivable level. I will walk humbly all the years he commits to the Lord because of this anguish of my soul. Lord, by such things men live in my spirit, finds life in them too. You've restored to me health and let me live. Okay, thank you, Lord. Thanks is in order. But you want to make sure that it was the perfect will of God. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. That's right. It was. In your love, you kept me from the pit of destruction. You put all of my sins behind your back. Yes, that is a fact. For the grave cannot praise you. What do you know about Sheol? Place of the departed dead in Hebrew theology, nothing. Death cannot sing your praise. How do you know that? Been there? Part of Sheol is, we've got a, a, a handout on the foyer rack that tells you all about Sheol. It's kind of a double-sided compartment that you read a lot about in, when we get to Luke 17. The rich man and Lazarus, one of them winds up in the good side of the contact coal capsule called Sheol, and the other winds up on the, the bad side. And there's a great gulf between the two, and the two can't cross over. No second chances after death. I'll let you read that on, on your own. <clears throat> But he knows nothing uh, about that. Hell is different than Sheol. Okay? Sheol was that side of the cross that before Jesus Christ came. Sheol was the place of the departed dead where good and evil went. But it was two different compartments separated by a chasm. After the cross of Jesus Christ, again, it's all explained on that handout there called Sheol that I hand-colored myself on my computer. I'm no artist, so we have stick figures. I apologize for that, but you kind of wonder where did Jesus go when he dismissed his spirit on the cross? It says he de descended into the heart of the earth, where Sheol was. I'll let you read all about that later on. The living, verse 19, the living, they praise you as I am doing today. The dead praise him more if they know him. I, heaven's going to be a sweet place of praise and worship. Fathers tell their children about your faithfulness. The Lord 
uh, will save me and we will sing with stringed instruments all the days of our lives in the temple of the Lord. I'm sure he meant every word. He just wasn't able to keep his word. Isaiah had said, prepare a poultice of figs and apply it to the boil and he will recover. So this obviously has become sepsis where the poison has entered the bloodstream and that's what he's dying of, but it started with a boil. And according to uh, Old Testament medicinal practices, well, you apply a poultice of figs on it. And God says, I will. So God sometimes uses medical practices to affect a healing. That's okay. Don't, don't say, well, I'm a man or woman of faith. I'm never going to the doctor. No, no, no. You're never going to the doctor because you're scared of what you might learn. That's why you don't go to doctors. Going to the doctor for me is like changing the oil in your car. You don't do it because something's wrong. You do it because you don't want something to go wrong. So the person that says, I'm never going to the doctor, I'm just going to pray, it's just like the same person that says, I bought this car new and I haven't changed the oil in 30 years. <laughs> if you think that's smart, then stay away from all doctors and never go. Or practice a little bit of preventive maintenance on your body like you do your car. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but that's you and the Lord now. Don't, don't lecture me about it later, I'm just telling you. What the Word of God, how, how to apply it to your life. So apply this poultice. So God uses this medicinal treatment, and he uses it as a sign. And God often does You bring about healing through medical treatments, uh, apart from an unusual direction from God. Uh, but medical treatment should never be rejected in the name of faith. Exercise your faith. Trust God. Pray. Be anointed with oil by the elders, do all of those biblical things. And then go to the doctor. And it, uh, sometimes the doctor, well, with, with my son Luke, they look at his MRI of his brain. Luke has one hemisphere of his brain that is not there. Now, you look at my 40-year-old son, Luke, that sits on the front row with me, and aside from uh, occasional seizures, he's as normal as rainwater. He went to school, he finished high school uh, with honors, did, did just fine. And they told us when he, when he was born, once they found the hydrocephalus, well, prepare yourself, he may never eat, drink, talk, or be able to bathe himself, take care of himself. Just prepare yourself for a vegetable. <laughs> that will keep alive for the next 40 years, and then he'll die. Thanks for the good news. He'll never walk, he'll never talk, probably can't hear. What do we do? We trusted God. We prayed. We anointed with oil. He's gone through uh, something the far side of half a dozen brain surgeries. One time he caught a brain infection. It teaches you to pray a lot. But it does, is God in the miracle of working business? My boy is a miracle. He used doctors to do that. I'm good with that. Could God have healed his hydrocephalus and restored that hemisphere that's missing? Yes, God could have. God didn't. So I believe that my son represents the perfect will of God. I have learned so many lessons about faith through my son and because of what me and Kathy went through with our son. And they said, well, don't these seizures really rattle you and bother you? This is our normal we deal with grand mal seizures and petty mal seizures all the time. We go to the doctors nonstop. That's our life. That's my normal. You don't, it's not yours. But this is God's perfect will for me. Embrace God's perfect will for you. Don't fight him on it. He loves you so much. But sometimes, because we live in a sinful, fallen world, things happen, bad things happen to good people, and God will see you through it. God will see you through it. Can I tell you, all you need in life, all you really need in life is God, okay? You may think you need something else, a bigger house, more money, a fancier car, a different husband, different wife, different kids, whatever. Maybe you could trade him in. I don't know. You got issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the answer is found in Christ Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through him. <clears throat> and every test, every trial in life is meant to draw you closer to him. Let it. Don't let it harden your heart. When bad things happen to good people, there's only two responses. You soften your heart or you harden your heart. There's no in-between. But you choose the path you take when those trials hit. 
God's just drawing you close to himself. I'm thinking of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and looking forward to what he had to face, worse than anything all of us together have faced in this life. And God got him through it, didn't he? And he's exalted him to the right hand of the throne of majesty. It all worked out just peachy keno, didn't it? We trust God. We trust God on all of these issues. So anyway, Hezekiah, verse 22, had asked, what will be the sign that I'll go up to the temple of the Lord? Well, that's what, that was it, that the sundial thing going on. Chapter 39 tells us, and we don't have time to get into tonight, what did, he, what did he do with that extension of his life that God had graciously given him? It's the permissive will of God, so I already know it's going to fall short of the perfect will of God. It's already going to fall short. Now God will allow him to do this stuff, but it does not represent the perfect will of God. If you haven't noticed, God lets you be stupid from time to time if you insist. You hear what I'm saying? God will let you go into the land of stupid. I mean, you can, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go. God says, hey, you know. Reminds me of when Luke, when he was eight years old, we were living up in the top end of security. And he decided before he got home from work, he was going to take apart the derailleur on his 10-speed bicycle. And when he did, springs and parts and ball bearings went ping, 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 all over the place, and most of them rolled down the driveway. And he came home and and I said, son, if you'd have just asked me, I would have helped you and we could have avoided all of this. Why did, why did you do that? Because I wanted to prove that I could do it, Dad. I said, well, you just proved you can't. And next time, ask for help, and I would be glad to. Leaving the derailleur alone, perfect will of God. Letting Dad help you, perfect will of God. You taking things into your own hands, permissive will of God, stupid, it won't turn out well. You see the difference? Always seek the perfect will of God. Because the other side of that coin is not nearly as pleasant. Let's stand and close in prayer. Ah, I love these chapters. I just love these chapters. Heavenly Father, your word is so applicable to right where we're at in life. Life is fraught with hardship and trial and, and disease and uncertainty and things I, I have no control over. But I know this. You're the answer to all of my problems. You're the answer to health problems, financial problems, relationship problems. I know this. If I raise my hands and empty my heart, you got this. And I want nothing more than your perfect will for my life. If that's taking me home when I'm 39 years of age, I embrace that and say, I'm coming home to glory. If it's your will that we live to be 110 years old, I praise you, I give you glory. But I'm not clinging to this life. I'm clinging to you, Lord. I'm clinging to you by faith. You've already provided all that we need. Your word has so many promises that we've yet to even read. So many promises that you've given us to increase our faith and encourage us along life's difficult journey. I commit it all into your hands, Lord. Every relationship that I have, my brother, my wife, all those that are sick in our congregation, my finances, this building, the future, the past, the present, I just give it all to you because I don't want to be anxious about any of these things. I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And that's all I need to know. We cling to you and stand by faith, Father, and praise you for your word that teaches us so many lessons. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. God is good. Amen? All the time. See you Sunday.